There we go. Okay, guys, welcome to um, Open Water Nitrox. It's uh, Enriched Air Nitrox class. My name is Benjamin Hatfield. I'll be your instructor for this evening. We're going to be going through all the key pieces of this. My qualifications to teach this class are pretty straightforward. Uh, I am a master instructor with SSI. Um, also an enriched air nitrox instructor and an extended range nitrox instructor. What that means to you is I can teach level one, which is up to 32%, level two, up to 40%, um, and level three, which is not really level three, but it's extended range up to 100%. So I can teach you to breathe all the way to pure oxygen as well. So we're going to stop at level two today, which is just going to be extended range ni or just nitrox as well. As we go th through this, I always encourage you guys to always continue to think about what does your dive journey look like and where do you want this diving uh, spectacular journey to go as well. well. There's a lot of different opportunities to do that. Night and Limited Viz is one of my favorites. Um, other cool things, um, you've got uh, deep diving, wreck diving. There's all kinds of different kinds of diving you can certainly do. You can get into ecology. Um, search and rescue is always fun to teach. Um just a lot of different directions, but think about what you kind of diving you want to accomplish in your diving career. Um, my kind of go-tos on this, night limited visibility, deep and stress and rescue with React Right are always kind of my, my go-to for courses um, because they give you the broadest range and the most freedom in your diving. So as you look at that, the cool stuff, diving, night and limited vis, come, that cool things come out at night, deep diving, there's a lot of cool stuff past 60 feet. Stress and rescue and react right go together, um, but the idea is as we teach you to be stressed in a situation and how to create some basic self-rescues. No, I will not teach you to d jump out of a helicopter at 60 miles an hour, um, but you will at least be able to be pro uh, provide a basic amount of um, help and first responder um, assistance to those around you. Um, so let's get into it. We're going to talk about enriched air nitrox. What the heck is nitrox any well actually any in the air that we breathe is nitrogen and oxygen mm -hmm. but nitrox and i think in scuba is anything that's over 21 percent nitrogen absolutely so the what we're breathing today is a nitrox blend but for the purpose of scuba diving we talk about nitrox being um any breathing gas will breathe that's more than 21 percent oxygen um, and less and less than 79% nitrogen. Now, was, if we added any other gas, it would it would uh, consider be considered a different gas. We would it no longer be nitrox; it'd be heliotrox or trimix um, or hydrolox or something different. It's something cool, you know. They've got all these other cool names for stuff. Um, but with what we're breathing today, we're just breathing tri because uh, or not tri uh, nitrox, which is just two different um, blends. So overall, as we look at this, uh, we're going to start talking about. Uh, going into two different levels of nitrox, nitrox level one and nitrox level two. Nitrox level one takes you up to 32%. It's, it's a light mix of nitrox. And nitrox level two will take you all the way to 40% nitrox. Um, and the key things as you kind of look at this, we're, um, I like looking at this, uh, this visual. The nitrogen we breathe in and out every day um, becomes our problematic gas when we're diving. The more nitrogen we breathe, the 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 longer uh, we have to do safety stops, the the shorter our, or the longer our surface intervals have to be, the more we have to off gas. Because as we on gas, I like to like, and while I do not drink, uh, I do like to liken it to hard liquor, right? So the easiest way to avoid a hangover from drinking scotch is to drink less scotch or not no scotch at all, right? Uh, that's a pretty simple process. Same thing with nitrogen. The, the way to increase our safety is to breathe less nitrogen. So if we breathe less nitrogen and we up gas um, on gas less nitrogen, we have less nitrogen to off gas, right? Same thing with cupcakes. If I eat less cupcakes, I get less fat, right? Pretty simple process. So what are the, some of the advantages to using nitrox? Uh, less uh, wait time on the boat for the next dive and longer uh, bottom times. Absolutely. What are some of uh, Michael? Have you had a chance to read the book yet? I, I have not. Keelan sent me the link um, recently, so I, I I was dive certified a number of years ago, and um, I'm kind of refreshing. Not a worry. So you'll definitely want to go through and make sure all the the uh, the homework is done on this as well uh, as you go through. So because uh, I can't certify you until you do the homework. 
And just to uh, clarify, is that in the SSI app, all the homework? Yes, all the, all okay. the homework is in the SSI Perfect. app under uh, Nitrox. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I'll make sure Michael's set up with all of that. You hear that, Michael? Your wife is going to make sure you did your homework. Yes. I'm old school. I've got, I've got a book from 2014. I don't I haven't logged into the app. Not a worry. So some of the limitations to Nitrox is we talk about the idea that uh, we can get longer bottom times, we can get shorter surface intervals, more energy after a dive, and safer dives. But one of the misnomers with Nitrox is that we can dive deeper. And that's a complete misnomer as we kind of talk about this dynamic. Um, you, it's not that you can dive deeper. It's that you can dive to the same depths and you can spend longer periods of time at that with greater safety margins. Um, there is the limitation of Nitrox is there's only so much partial pressure of oxygen that we can breathe overall. So, so as, we, as we start looking at the idea of partial pressure, um, we start looking at the idea of um, increased pressure of the gas at depth. So as we breathing EAN21, which is just air that we're breathing, we're breathing a combination of which would what would be 79% nitrogen and 21% oxygen, right? As we go down to two bar, which would be 33 feet seawater, we have a compression. And, and what we do is we literally compress the molecules but or the space between the molecules. And in the same amount of space, we now have what's equal to 158% nitrogen and now 42% oxygen. And I like the way I like to explain this and the simplest way to, to do this was if we had a sponge, and this is um, and this would be equivalent to one molecule of air that we're breathing at the surface, right? So the blue, the dark blue would be the 21% oxygen, the lighter blue would be the um, 79% um, nitrogen, right? As we go down, what ends up happening is the pressure of the of the everything around us, specifically the water right, creates pressure. And as pressure equally goes around all of us, we can thank uh, our good friend Boyle for that, what ends up happening is it presses everything and compresses it in. It doesn't compress the molecules, but it reduces the amount of space between them. So now at the surface, we have one molecule of air. At, the, at depth of 33 feet, we have the equal equivalent of two molecules of air in the same amount of space. So instead of the equivalent of breathing in that molecule of air that we're used to, 21% oxygen. Now we're breathing 42% oxygen. If we go down to 66 feet, it's the same as squeezing three of these little bad boys in together. Let's see if I can get them. Oh, I said flat. There we go. Squeeze them in. We lose all the space between the molecules. And now we're breathing the same equivalent of what? 21, 42. What's the next percentage? 63. 63. Absolutely. So it's equivalent of breathing 63% oxygen. And so on and so on. At 99 feet, it's equivalent of breathing 84% uh, oxygen, right? Does that make sense? So here's how it kind of works with nitrogen. Uh, the, the challenge is, is as we go down, we get to 22, uh, 33 feet, I'm sorry, um, and we're breathing the equivalent of 158% nitrogen. So as we start uh, breathing in that thicker, uh, that denser amount of nitrogen, that higher partial pressure PPN2, uh, partial pressure of nitrogen, it has to go somewhere. And because nitrogen is not a bondable gas like oxygen that bonds with a hemoglobin in our blood, it goes into our tissue, into our bloodstream, and it bonds into the tissue compartments in our body. And so as it's bonding into these tissue compartments in our body, um, it's going into what we theoretically say is 16 different tissue compartments that have varying speed of ability to accept that nitrogen in. We call that profusion. So as this nitrogen is going into our bloodstream, we're breathing it in through our, our mouth, into our lungs, and uh, through the alveolar in our lungs, which are about 300 million of those little bad boys, into the uh, our arterial gas network. That nitrogen goes out, in the, out and it goes into 16 tissue compartments. And these tissue compartments range from things like our brainstem, which is a very fast tissue compartment. It doesn't take long for nitrogen to perfuse into that tissue compartment to our fat. And our fat is a very slow, has a very slow solubility. It takes a long time for it to absorb nitrogen. In the same way as it absorbs, the same way for it to off gas as well, for it to diffuse. As it's diffusing, it uh, coming out of the, the fat is a, takes a lot longer for it to come out of the fat than it does come out of the brainstem. Now, when it comes out of those tissue compartments, it's coming out in the form of bubbles. 
these little nit this nitrogen gas has to do something. It's not liquid, it's gas. So it creates bubbles. And the first level of these bubbles we talk about is they're silent bubbles. They're very small, they're hard to register, they're really little bitty. They get a little bigger to bubble seeds and then eventually they become problematic or symptomatic bubbles. And when the bubbles get too large because they're coming out too quickly, um, then they become a problem. And, they get, and that's when we start getting, talk about things like getting the bends, right? So that's the, that's the challenge is that we've got that nitrogen and we have to, it's coming in and it's going out, right? It, uh, as we rise, as we reduce pressure, it's going to, re, it, those bubbles are going to come back out um, and we got to do something with it. So if we're, if our body perfuses and, and saturates to 158% nitrogen on air at 33 feet, here's the, the bonus is that if we're breathing 32% nitrox uh, at 33 feet, we're only perfusing 136%. We're perfusing literally 12% less nitrogen into our system. So just like the, the, the scotch drinking scenario, if I drink less scotch with my buddies on Friday night, I have much less hangover on Saturday morning. Um, that I, and I don't have to explain to my wife what happened and why I was drinking scotch with my buddies. That would be a big surprise to Nikki, by the way, if, if I came home one night and said, I was, I was out with my buddies drinking scotch and smoking cigars. She, she might call the, uh, the doctor or, or the Bishop one. I'm not sure which for would be first, probably actually the stake president because he's across the street. But <laughs> anyway, so it, it would definitely be, um, a different situation. Uh, it's a better situation that if you drink less, you have less problems. So that's kind of the benefit of nitrox as we look at this. So there's two different directions we can look at when we start talking about the amount of oxygen that we're breathing. And this is specific to oxygen only, right, uh, that we're going to look at. And uh, so as we kind of look at this, this idea, I'm going to take my little uh, thing off there so you can see it. There's two directions. So we're breathing 21% oxygen, 21% uh, oxygen, 0.21 PPO2, right? That's the normal partial pressure for air, for the level of air we want to breathe. Everything's good. We go for jogs. We feel good. Life is good, right? But as we start reducing that partial pressure of air, we start getting into a, a hypoxic situation. So at 0.16, that's the threshold for hypoxia. And that's the level that exercise tolerance and mental performance begins to diminish. Um, so it's important to understand that. As that partial pressure of oxygen decreases even further at 0.12, that's the minimum level required required to maintain conscious and that's approximate right we all handle this a little differently at 0.10 that's a minimum level to, that's required to sustain life okay now i would encourage you guys if you wouldn't mind terribly write down 0.10 um the partial pressure of oxygen is where you die um that's the minimum level to sustain life um that will be a test question just by the way now, if we take oxygen the other direction and we start creating a higher partial pressure of oxygen, we start looking at, at 1.10, 110% oxygen. That's the threshold where oxygen toxicity symptoms, both pulmonary and, and uh, central nervous system, CNS, will be uh, uh, begin to uh, create symptoms. At 1.40, that's the partial pressure oxygen presents a moderate risk to divers. And that's the recommended limit for recreational diving. And that's the other number you want to write down. 1.4 is the recommended uh, PPO2, partial pressure limit for recreational diving. Okay. 1.6 is the partial pressure at which oxygen presents a more substantial risk to divers. And it's the absolute partial pressure limit for recreational diving. And I would write that one down too. So as you guys go through this, um, there's two ends of the spectrum. Not enough. Um, hypoxia is when there's not enough oxygen. Hyperoxia, when there's too much as we go through this process. So the benefits of using uh, breathing less nitrogen, you, uh, we've kind of gone through. We If we breathe less nitrogen, we, we absorb less nitrogen in the tissue. As we come up, we have less nitrogen to come out of the tissue. So it's a pretty basic idea, right? Um, the other benefits to this is, is, if nitrogen is narcotic, then I have less chance of having nitrogen narcosis at depth, right? So after 60 feet, um, and uh, after 2.34, 234% nitrogen, uh, partial pressure of nitrogen, 
nitrogen starts to create a narcotic effect. Now, if I if I reduce that number, I get I have less chance of it becoming narcotic, right? It's it's one of those things. Um, if I if I uh, break my leg and they give me Vicodin, if I take half a Vicodin, it'll ease the pain. If I take four Vicodins, I'll be zooming through the atmosphere, right? Um, kind of deal. So I have if I take less of it, uh, nitrogen is a drug, and there's a dose of it, right? If I have less of it, I have less of that problem. Nitrox also, nitrox also gives us that decompression, re, um, that reduction of decompression sickness opportunity as well. If I have less nitrogen uh, in my system, I don't have the chance of having nitrogen coming out in the form of bubbles creating problems. Now, the sacrifice of the nitrox safety margin is an interesting debate um, as we kind of go through this idea. Now, as we kind of looked at on the dive tables earlier um, in open water class, we kind of got the idea really quickly that I can dive a lot longer on nitrox than I can on air. Fair enough? Because, because the limiting factor is nitrogen. That's exactly right. Um, so as we look at this and we kind of look at the dive tables, we know that at 60 minutes on air, as we look at this dive table, that I can get a 50-minute dive. But at, on 36% nitrox at 57 feet, I can dive for 130 minutes, two and a half times longer, literally, um, on nitrox, right? So one of the things you can do, and people do do this, is what they'll do is they'll leave their computers set to air, and they'll dive a nitrox blend. And by doing that, what it does is if, if I can stay down for 50 minutes on air, and I can stay down for 130 minutes, on nitrox 36 that means if i come up at 50 minutes i've got a 150 percent safety margin or 250 percent safety margin uh built in is it a good thing is kind of the question uh keelan what do you think diving air uh, diving nitrox on an air table good thing or bad thing it would make it more difficult to determine where you are on the dive table i think i mean it would just add another variable it certainly does, um, but if you if you just stuck to the air table, you said okay. Yeah, I mean, you could figure it out. Yeah, my, my maximum dive today is fifty minutes because the air table says fifty minutes is my maximum dive. But yeah, um, I'm diving nitrox. Right. So, it's, I, I it's, think that's it's, a good it's, idea if you're getting used to nitrox and you're a new diver and you're worried about running out of air and bends and so forth. I think if you're using an oxygen table, you're going to be so far within the margins that you don't have to worry that much about the right. DSC. Absolutely. It's kind of like resetting the gas gauge in your car that when it's really on half um, or really uh, it's on half, you're, you're seeing that it's empty, right? You still right. have another 200 miles left um, on your gas tank, but you think it's empty. So it's it's forcing you to have a safety margin, right? So, so some people set their clocks 10 minutes early. So they, absolutely. because they're they might, absolutely, they might, yeah. yeah, this builds in a safety buffer. You can certainly do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. For me and uh, for my suggestion is I generally suggest knowing exactly where you are so you can make competent decisions based upon actual information. I'd rather have the actual information and, and uh, predetermine that for myself and just make sure I'm safe. Now, the magic question is this of this today is, is richer gas better? Keelan, what do you think? Is it better to um, always dive a 36% blend? I assume it depends on the situation. Like maybe not every dive you do would require that. Like if you're not diving that deeper for very long. Well, absolutely. So everything in moderation is the way I look at it. Um, and uh, so as you start putting this together, you want to make sure you're diving appropriately. And that's kind of the bigger thing. Sorry, there was a sticker uh, left over from donating blood today and I, it was bugging me, so I took it off. Uh, but uh, as you go through this, moderate everything in moderation, right? Uh, one cupcake after dinner once a week, probably not going to make you fat. Two cupcakes every day uh, for lunch and dinner, uh, absolutely going to make you fat, right? Unless you're... Um, Iliad, Iliad Kachobi, and you and you run 400 miles a week, right? That that boy could probably re eat uh, two pizzas and and a dozen cupcakes every day, and he'd probably still lose weight, little turd. But 
<laughs> Everything in moderation, right? You want to make sure we're doing it the right way. And we talked about it a little bit earlier that there absolutely is a limiting factor to nitrox. That as you kind of go through this process, you have to be aware um, that there is too much of a good thing, right? I I am all about the cupcake. I love cupcakes and chocolate chip cookies, man. I, I can certainly do some damage there, but everything in moderation. One, good. 20, not so good, right? A, a little bit of nitrox, good. A lot of nitrox could be bad. Same idea. So as we kind of continue down this process, there are a lot of laws in diving um, overall. And uh, I'd like to at least introduce them to you and give you the idea um, Henry's law, Dalton's law are the two, the number one and number two rule we use in nitrox diving. Um, and honestly, reading, just starting to read the descriptions here, I already start to fall asleep. So my heart is with you guys. Yes, I know these, but would you guys be interested if we had a little simpler way of explaining this other than the amount of guys? Is all the, 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. So basically Henry's is very simple. Um, Henry's law basically talks about how a gas dissolves in a liquid, the liquid being our blood, okay, um, that in this particular case. All he's basically saying is a couple of things. The first one is, is the amount of agitation of the liquid will determine how fast it will dissolve in the liquid. Make sense? The way I like to look is at that it is- that sort of like, Benjamin, is that sort of like making hot chocolate? The more you agitate it, the faster the hot chocolate gets into the milk? Exactly. I like to use Kool-Aid, but same thing. Oh, Kool-Aid. Um, okay. Yep. You put one pack of Kool-Aid in, you, you stir it slowly. It doesn't It doesn't mix real well. If you stir it real fast, it mixes it, it mixes really nicely. And that, what we're talking about in agitation is important here. It's now how fast our cardiovascular system is working. So as we breathe in this partial pressure of nitrogen, partial pressure of oxygen into our uh, – in, in – how fast our cardiovascular, how hard our cardiovascular system is working will determine how fast it goes into our venous system, into our tissue compartments, and how fast it comes out uh, through our, uh, our vein, or not, our, I'm sorry, our, our, into our arteries, out through our veins, right? Um, and how fast it goes in and comes out and how fast it perfuses into our tissue. That's the big thing he's trying to tell you is if your heart trace in fast, it's going to dissolve fast. Pretty straightforward. The second part about that he's talking, he wants, that's important for diving around in Idaho is it's directly tied to the temperature. And it's really interesting, if I think at least, maybe you think it's boring, but- uh, Ben, I'm sorry, can you say that again? That the- What's directly tied to the temperature? The rate of absorption of the gas into a liquid is directly tied to the temperature as well. Okay. So if gas is cold, it will absolve, it will dissolve faster into a liquid because as gas gets cold, it could, it gets compressed and it's, it literally shrinks. You know, remember we think cold makes it smaller, heat makes it bigger. As that gas is compressed by cold, it'll actually dissolve in a liquid much quicker. So that's important to kind of realize for Idaho diving, right? So if you're diving cold water, be aware, cold gas, uh, cold water dissolves nitrogen into your system more quickly. Easy enough? Okay. All right. And Dalton's law is just, uh, just as important. It's the law of partial pressures. Here's the easy thing to remember is it'll always be equal. So if I have two parts nitrogen, one part oxygen, it'll always add up to three. It'll always be equal. There's, there's not going to be a point where it's not going to be equal in that process. So that's all he's trying to tell you is that under pressure, it'll always be an equal level. So if, if we're at 33 feet, that's two atmospheres, it'll all, it'll be four plus two. At 66 feet, it'll be six plus three. And it'll keep going in that, in that way. It'll just keep adding and adding and adding. It'll always be an equal match. You'll never get to a point in an equal pressure situation where uh, you have something that's per perspectively different, right? It'll always be about 21% and it'll always be about 79%. It'll be equal percentages as we kind of go through. That's all Dalton's law is trying to tell you. Now, Dalton's law is our law to figure out the uh, the best blends and best mixes for nitrox. Um, so Dalton's law is the basis for most nitrox calculations. And I can certainly, the formulas are, are fun to look at. 
Um, PG if equals FG. Da, da, da. Again, I fall asleep really quickly on this. So simple enough. Let's do some math. Hopefully you guys have a pen and paper with you because we're going to do some math together. Um, and then I'm going to make your life super easy after that. I want, But I want you guys to understand the math because I feel like it's pretty important to have a good understanding. And Nikki will tell you that when we go order our nitrox, um, that I never use the tables or the cheater method. I actually, This is the math I actually use. So just to give a couple quick ideas, um, in practical application, um, oxygen is 21%, nitrogen is 79%. Easy enough, guys? Got that? Okay. Yeah, 30, yeah. yeah but that shows that it's 0.23% uh, instead of 23%. Because you have the decimal in front of it. Yeah, it's... Uh, Point two, it's point two one or twenty one percent. Okay, twenty one. I can. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Or seventy nine percent. Right. There we go. Uh, status space there. There we go. Uh, point two one or twenty one percent. Uh, seventy nine point seven nine or seventy nine percent. Right. So our our math then thirty three feet seawater uh, is equal to two atmospheres. So the air we breathe at two atmospheres times 0.21 equals 0.42 or uh, 42%, right? Uh, 2 ATA equals three, uh, two, uh, 33, uh, 33 feet seawater. Um, if we go down to 3 ATA, that's equal to 63% or, or 0.63 or 63% if we just want to make sure we're ultra clear on that. And three ATA is equal to 66 feet seawater. Easy enough? Just want to get make sure we're on the same terms and that our perspective is all correct. Now, just be aware at two atmospheres, uh, uh, times 0.79 or 79%, uh, just to make sure we got our, our terms, is equal to or uh, 158%. There we go. So there's your math. Uh, so just to be very clear. Now, on a safety note, Oxygen becomes toxic at 1.6. The working load for oxygen safety is 1.4. So you guys, as you as recreational divers, need to make sure you're staying at 1.4 um, or less on your partial pressure of oxygen. You can dump, dick, uh, dip into up to 1.6, but you don't want to be there and you want to stay there. That, uh, at 1.6 is your hard stop. Do not go past. Do not collect $200. Don't, collect, uh, don't pass go. Um, just be aware, nitrogen becomes to become begins to become narcotic at 2.37 percent, 2.37 partial pressure of nitrogen, PPN2, um, and nitrogen becomes unsafe at 3.95 PPN2. There we go. I'll go ahead and put all it on there for you. So here's the thing: is when nitrogen gets we get too deep on nitrogen. What happens is we start getting into nitrogen narcosis. And as we start getting into our nitrogen narcosis, nitrogen will become equal to one martini on an empty stomach at 100 feet and increase exponentially from there. So easy enough. Here's our formula on how to do this. It's pretty straightforward. We're going to take the depth and we're going to divide it by 33 feet, and that'll give us our actual atmosphere. Um, from that point, we're going to take that 1.4, we're going to divide it by the actual atmosphere, and that'll give our best mix. So why would we want to, uh, to understand a best mix? Why would we want to uh, have a best mix of nitrox? Anybody know? To minimize the risk of yeah. too much oxygen or nitrogen. Absolutely. So a good example of this, um, if Nikki and I like to go dive the, um, the Lady Luck, um, it's one of our favorite dives in the world. The deck is at about 120 feet. Um, roughly, um, fun, fun dive. What we do is before we call, we dive to the lady luck because we call up the dive shop that we like. We say, Hey, we're diving the lady luck today. Um, we want to go ahead and uh, order up nitrox for that. And, and the best blend for nitrox at 125 feet is 29%. So we want to go ahead and order our nitrox at 29%, please, because that'll give us our best partial pressure of night of auction for that depth where we're not getting into a safety issue, but we're also using the, the uh, best blend of oxygen and the least amount of nitrogen we can get to that depth to be safe. So we're, we're balancing our best blend. That's what we're doing um, is we're coming up with a best blend. So as we order that out, 
here's how we do it. If a diver wishes to make a dive to 115 feet, what is the best mixture for this dive? Simple enough. We take 115 foot depth and we divide that by 33. That gives us 3.48. We need to add one for the surface atmosphere, okay? Which gives us an actual atmospheric depth of 4.48. Now, all we need to do from that point is because we know our, our limit on oxygen is 1.4, we're going to divide 1.4 divided by 4.48, and that gives us 31% nitrox. Now, let's check ourselves. 115 feet on the chart, 31% nitrox, uh, nitrox, right? Now, this chart, if you guys would, uh, and hopefully you guys aren't on your phone. Let me find myself. If you would, open up your phone and find your My SSI app, please. And once you find your My SSI app, we're going to go to the lower portion okay. over here where it says more. And that'll I take you over. To do this, or you can come watch me upstairs. There we go. And on this floor portion right over here, you see it says tables. So we're going to do a tables. We're going to scroll down slightly. And you might see a table that says best gas mix table. We'll go ahead and open that up. And I would encourage opening that up in Imperial. You'll have to scroll over to Imperial and then hit open. And magically enough, that table might look just like the table that I was showing you. So you've seen how to do the math, and now you know where the table's at, right? Easy enough. But just to make sure we're all on the same sheet of music, let's go ahead and pull our calculators out, and let's do some math. If I want to do a, a dive to 80 feet... Simple enough, I'm going to divide 80 by 33. What does that equal? Two point four two. Yeah, two point four two. Exactly. All right. Why and I'm adding one for the surface, plus one equals three point four two four two, right? Yep. So overall. My, my answer here for actual atmospheric depth is 3.4242. Yeah. All I need to do now is divide 1.4 divided by 3.4242. 40%. Yeah, 40. Or round up to 41. Yep. 40. Do you, go, you ever go above 40%? Um, I do, um, but you guys shouldn't. So your okay. maximum is going to be 40%. Let's go back and check ourselves. So we do it an 80-foot dive. 80-foot dive is not on here. Not That's, on there. Right. <laughs> but uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Oh, that's mm. wrong. Table. But it, now you see that you at 40, you were maxed out at 40%. So at 80 feet, you can do a 40% a nitrox dive. Now, for how long? Well, let's go to the dive tables. That would be a dive table question. Let's see. Da, da, da. Uh, get over here. So the, the magic question is 40% 40, uh, 40 is equal to... There we go, 0. 0.43. Uh, 40%. It's not really on here, but um, on if you use your dive calculator, it should be 150 minutes. Okay. Let's see. Is that right? That's, that is not right. I take the, I take that. I'm sorry. That is incorrect. Um, it should be uh, 60 minutes. I'm sorry, Ma math math bad today. We'll go through the calculations on that in a little bit. We're gonna, right now. We're just worrying about uh, best blend. Okay. Uh, overall, so we'll we'll get into that. And and really, you want to make sure you're following your dive computer on that as well. But it gives you at least an idea. So let's do another one. If we did a hundred foot dive, get an extra zero in there. What is our best blend of nitrox for a hundred foot uh, hundred foot 
dive. So it's 4.03 and then 1.4 divided by 4.03, 34 mm -hmm. 34.7%. So you could round that up and make it 35. 35, yeah. Right. Yeah, so let's check the uh, dive table. 100, 35%. Easy enough. Now, here's the great thing is, again, you guys could, you guys got access to this table, but now you know how to do the math. Make sense? Yeah, the math is definitely not hard. Now, the other side of this, the great thing about all these calculations is it's one simple um, math problem. It's just we're uh, in one scenario, we're solving for X. Now we're going to solve for Y. So the Benjamin, other, yes, sir. So we're being trained for 60 feet. Correct. Do you use nitrogen at 60 right. feet? You absolutely can. Okay. But, so we would need to know the math on this because it's not on the charts. Yep. But you, the nice thing is at 60 feet, you can use, as you saw your maximum operating depth, um, you were able to use 40% at, at uh, 80 feet. So that right. means you can uh, definitely use uh, uh, forty percent at sixty feet. And so as we go over and look at this, da, 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 and it's pretty uncommon to use forty percent. You won't find a lot of dive shops that mix that hot, but sometimes you will. So if you just use the pre-done chart here, thirty-six percent to your sixty feet, fifty minutes for uh, twenty-one percent, one hundred and thirty minutes for fifty-seven feet, right? So, but we'll get into that in just a little bit. Let's let's get into the let's finish All up right. the math on how to get to maximum operating depth. So as we we pull out our our nitrox here, we say, okay, we've got to make sure that we're not diving below the maximum operating depth. Okay, the max operating depth it being that one point four. So is the working load. So simple. The math is pretty straightforward. It's going to be one point four divided by the partial pressure of the cylinder. Um, that's the nitrox blend. So if it's EAN 32, EAN 40, EAN 36, whatever it is, minus one. Why, uh, Michael, why are we minusing one in our formula here? Because of the air pressure above the surface. Exactly. Um, equals the atmosphere times 33. That'll give us our maximum operating depth. So a diver wants to know how deep he can dive with a mixture of 40% nitrox. So simple enough. 1.4 divided by... 0.4, which is 40%, equals 3.5. 3.5 minus the surface uh, uh, atmospheric pressure equals 2.5. 2.5 times 33 equals 82 and a half feet is his maximum operating depth on nitrox. So you guys will be good to go. Um, you can do at, at your 60 foot dive, you're good to go up to 40% on that. Let's do the math together though. So if I do a dive, let's see, I'm going to let, uh, put that back on. Give me a second here. Let's see. Here we go. Here's your math, right? So if I wanted to do a dive to 70 feet, I, I take that back. Let's do a better one. Uh, let me think about this for a minute. Um, I had it. I used to have a math problem on there. Uh, let's see. Give me a second. If I wanted to do a dive to, um, how about 103 feet? What is the maximum operating depth? I'm sorry. If I if I, I, I I'm sorry. I'm having a brain aneurysm today. I apologize. If my dive shop handed me 36% nitrox, what is the maximum operating depth? If they handed me 36% nitrox. Okay, so these, do these numbers on the screen mean anything to us? Yeah, 1.4 divided by, they just handed 36. you a 36% blend. Okay. There we go, finished up the math formula. That's, that's your math formula. So it's the maximum operating depth for 36%. 
I get 95. 95, yeah. That's exactly right. How about if they um, if I walked into my dive shop and they handed me 32% nitrox? Hundred and eleven. Exactly. That's all there is to it. Now the good news is this chart is on your um, uh, uh, tables as well, so you'll be able to use this chart as well. Makes sense. So you now you know how to do the math, and and it's important that when you get your nitrox bottle that you mark it accordingly as well. And we're going to go through that in just a little bit. Uh, there's a, a few other things I want to go through first. Uh, before we get into marking bottles and dive tables as well. So as we kind of go through this process, uh, one of the concerns that uh, um, SSI is really concerned about is nitronarcosis. Um, now, the secret to nitronarcosis is most people don't get nitronarcosis. They actually get carbon dioxide buildup or hypercapnia, but they, the signs and symptoms uh, of hypercapnia and nitronarcosis are very, very similar. Um, it's hard to tell the difference between the two. But there's a lot of theories of what causes nitronarcosis, and there's a lot of really cool names for them. Uh, there's the Quastel metabolic theory. There's the uh, uh, clathrate theory. There's the iceberg theory. The most common and most plausible to most scientists is called the Myers-Overton theory. And basically what the Myers-Overton theory is telling us is that the nitrogen goes in and it disrupts the ability of the neurons to fire one to the other. When you get to too high a partial pressure, nitrogen becomes narcotic, narcotic, uh, the brain uh, stops, starts misfiring, if you will, and it's not able to make those clear decisions um, of what's going on uh, overall. Now, the signs and symptoms um, that are for nitronarcosis are uh, pretty straightforward, uh, but how it happens and how we get this carbon dioxide or high recapnia or carb, uh, nitronarcosis happening are pretty straight, uh, pretty interesting. Some of the things that create and cause nitronarcosis to happen or are carbon dioxide buildup, hypercapnia, a rapid descent, cold. Certain drugs and, medi uh, and medications can reduce the body's ability to process that oxygen and, and help uh, be a pre uh, pre uh, create nitronarcosis. Um, limited visibility and darkness. So basically your, your brain goes into overload and it's, it's trying to process something else and it's not able to fire those neurons correctly. So it, it, it can help you get nitronarcosis, uh, loss of orientation, high air consumption, inexperience at depths below 60 feet, over task loading, again, the brain misfiring again, lack of sleep, brain issue, um, overexertion, psychological outlook, ex expecting narcosis to be more severe than it really is, anxiety, time pressure, and fatigue. And those are the most common factors, signs and symptoms that are predisposing factors that can create and, and help you get nitronarcosis. Now, the symptoms of nitronarcosis are pretty straightforward as well. Um, any, if you ever go to the drunk tank on a Saturday night, you pretty much have seen what nitronarcosis could look like. Uh, things like a feeling of extreme relax, relaxation, lightheadedness, euphoria, or kind of loopy, uh, slowed response. We, we've, we've all seen drunks. They're not the fastest thing on two feet, right? Um, I always love watching the cops when the drunk guy tries to run away from the cop and, and he's like, oh, you know, it's like, dude, you're getting caught. Why are you even running, man? Um, slowed response, a feeling of well-being, increased judgmental errors or giddiness. I, again, watching an episode of Cops will give you that one. Um, deterioration of fine dexterity, fixation on ideas, um, time distortion, um, deterioration of multitask reasoning, numbness, tingling, and sleepiness inability to remember parts of the dive um, for the Atlantic divers that do those deep, did the deep wrecks in the eighties and nineties when they were diving just air too deep on air, they were really getting narked out. And one of their jokes was, is I've been there. I've dove that I've seen that and forgot it. Um, Nikki and I were diving the lady luck one time. We were doing a deco dive and we're at about 120 feet. And we, I was over by this eight foot gold seahorse that's on the stern of the ship. It's really cool. It's really fun. And I noticed these two recreational divers had come down and they were kind of circling around the, the seahorse and then they went back up. They, they probably circled there for five or 10 minutes and then went back up. Dickie and I did our thing for a while longer and eventually we went back up. But it's interesting. 
the husband was asking the wife, what did you think of the gold seahorse? Now, remember, this seahorse is eight feet tall and gold. Uh, the uh, wife said, what seahorse? And they had swam around this thing for 10 minutes. And so he said, the the the, the gold seahorse that we swam around, she's, I didn't see a seahorse. She was absolutely positively narked. Um, so that's a very common common thing. That also happens in hypercapnia as well. Um, confusion, semi-conscious, disoriented uh, memory of the dive, decreased conceptual reasoning, visual and auditory hallucinations are relatively common, um, paranoia or anxiety. So as you kind of go through that, um, be aware that if you feel outside the norm, your reasoning goes away. You're not able to do simple math, for example. It's a good chance you could have hypercapnia or narcosis. They they both they don't they both have a very similar uh, result. Um, they come from different dynamics, but they're both come from the from being too deep. Um, does narcosis cause complications? Might be the next thing. You know, so narcosis is fairly common, but the good news is it's temporary. Uh, and it doesn't uh, doesn't have lasting effects. And some divers will des, uh, develop nitrogen narcosis, become too disoriented to swim to shallower water. In other cases, a diver can fall asleep while uh, while, under, uh, while down. Now, trying to get yourself back to the surface could also lead to complications if you come up too quickly, and that can cause the bends. So, if you you should seek medical treatment if you experience any of the following. Fatigue, appetite loss, headache, joint pain, joint muscle pain, um, any, any pain in the tendons, swelling, dizziness, pain in the chest, trouble breathing, double vision, speaking difficulties, muscle weakness, primarily on one side of your body or flu-like symptoms. Now, those are uh, things to be aware of. Now, oddly enough, most of those don't really correspond with nitrocosis. Most of those correspond more with DCS, um, but... Diving is a very self-aware sport. And I really want to impress upon you guys is as you feel getting off the boat is how you should feel getting back on the boat. Just maybe a little bit more giddy because I saw a cool fish. Yeah, or I saw a seahorse. It was so cool. That's how you should really feel getting on the boat. So the magic question is how is hypercapnia or nitrogen narcosis treated? Keelan, you want to take a guess at that one? Well, if... The symptoms aren't chronic or serious. I assume it will go away over time as you safely come to the surface and decompress. Yeah. Shallow up. If you notice any signs and symptoms, shallow up until the symptoms um, go away or decrease, right? And then don't dive deeper. If there's real serious, go ahead and sh uh, surface completely. Come to the, come, go ahead and come all the way to the surface and then uh, take some time and don't dive again. If they're super serious, come to the surface, get on the boat and go on pure oxygen. Simple enough. That's the, uh, most of the time, the, uh, treatment for most diving related, uh, challenges is going to be pure oxygen. So that's a pretty simple process. If you feel any of that, um, and you're still on the boat and you're feeling the lightheadedness, headaches, uh, don't be afraid. Tell somebody about it immediately and uh, get on pure oxygen and, and, and seek medical treatment. So the other the, the other thing we're kind of talking about, we're going to move out of the nitrogen narcosis and hypercapnia a little bit, is the effects of oxygen on a diver. Um, so there's a couple of dynamics. We talked a little bit about hypoxia. Um, and uh, the interesting thing with hypoxia and, you know, excessive nitrogen, uh, they just executed that prisoner in the South recently, um, basically by through hypoxia. Um, taking him to a point of anioxia, anioxia, which is a complete lack of oxygen um, altogether. Um, so what hypoxia is, is low oxygen. Um, the physical, uh, physiological types of oxygen, uh, hypoxia are pretty straightforward. Um, dizziness, lack of ability to remember the dive, um, you, going through those processes. Now, what we really are worrying more about, because hypoxia is going to be pretty rare for you guys, is really going to be more hyperoxygen hyperoxia or oxygen toxicity um, and getting into CNS or CNS toxicity, which CNS means central nervous system oxygen toxicity. Okay. So, uh, or pulmonary oxygen toxicity. So let's start with the pulmonary. What, what do you guys think would be the difference between central nervous system toxicity and pulmonary oxygen toxicity? Brain versus lungs. Exactly. That's exactly right. 
So interestingly enough, auction toxicity in, in terms of pulmonary auction, auction to, pulmonary auction toxicity was originally studied by Dr. J. Lorraine Smith. Um, and he first discovered the effects in 1899. And he noted that the severity of the effects increased with the increased partial pressure of oxygen, and the effects were largely reversible. Now, the toxic effects of those of the oxygen of partial pressures between 0.45 and 1.6 were largely located within the lungs. And the toxic effects of partial pressures of 1.6 uh, and above are primarily in the brain. So oxygen toxicity signs and symptoms in the pulmonary region are start off with a mild irritation in the, in the throat or the trachea, made worse by deep breathing. After that, a mild cough starts to develop. And then finally, uh, more severe symptoms and irritation cough become becomes uh, a lot more painful and much more uncontrollable. Um, if oxygen, exposure of oxygen is continued, the person will start noticing tightness in the chest, um, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath. And if exposure continues too long, the person actually could die from lack of oxygen. What ends up happening is the uh, body's ability to process the oxygen through the hemoglobin barrier in the uh, alveolar actually stops. and the, the, It becomes overwhelmed. Um, so the progressive damage to the lungs eventually makes it impossible for the person to breathe and, they, uh, and blood to pass the oxygen into the, through the lungs. Um, and they eventually die. So it's interesting that you can actually die from too much oxygen. So oxygen toxicity for pulmonary um, and I know it talks about this in the book, but I'd really like to put some kind of straight, straight answers out there. Here's what we discovered. Over the course of most individuals can tolerate 12 to 14 hours. This is pulmonary oxygen toxicity, by the way, pulmonary only. 12 to 16 hours at, at 100% oxygen. 8 to 14 hours at 150% oxygen. And 3 to 6 hours at a partial pressure of uh, 200% before developing mild symptoms. Now, there's several ways to track pulmonary oxygen toxicity, but the most sensitive and accurate is the development of symptoms. That's the absolute. The second way is to do a vital capacity check. Now, the good news is, is in most cases of pulmonary oxygen toxicity, um, the uh, damage to the lungs is largely reversible with mild effects. Uh, now, the damage can take up to two to four weeks to heal. Now, the other side of that um, that Michael was very astute in noting is in central nervous system toxicity. That's when we start breathing that 1.4 above or we have, we, we're on par partial pressure of oxygen too long. We can develop central nervous system oxygen toxicity, too much oxygen in the brain. Now, the signs and symptoms of pulmonary or central nervous system oxygen toxicity, CNS, are, there's an acronym for that, and I have to have that where I put it on the screen. It's called convented. Now, with convented, CON for convulsions, grand mal seizures, usually without warning. I have yet to see have somebody come up to me and say, hey, by the way, in, in one minute and 32 seconds, I'm going to have a grand mal seizure. Would you mind holding my wallet? It, it just doesn't work that way, right? So I like that they add without warning. Um, vision, tunnel vision, uh, or other visual changes ringing in the ears um, or other changes, nausea, mild to severe, uh, twitching, usually in the facial muscles, um, especially since we're talking about central nervous system, irritability, behavior changes or personality changes, dizziness, vertigo, or disorientation. Now, one of the things that being a team diver, we're very astute and we're very observ observant of not only ourselves, but our dive buddy as well. So if we start noticing that our vision narrows, we start getting ringing. I, now I have ringing in the ears all the, all the time for my tinnitus, but the good news is when I dive, I don't have it. So if I come back to the surface and I suddenly have it again, that's not a big deal. But if my, my face starts twitching all the time, right? Or I become really irritable, maybe something's wrong. It's something definitely to be uh, aware of. Uh, grand mal seizure, somebody flops on the deck and starts having a grand mal seizure, we should definitely definitely be aware of, of that. So quick quiz, uh, quick quiz for you. This one's for Michael. Mr. Michael, as you dive deeper, the narcotic effect of nitrogen gets greater. Absolutely. Good job. All right. The next one is for Keelan. Which of the following is not a symptom of decompression sickness? I believe it's C. It is. Blue is, that is a, yeah. 
uh, hypoxia or um, hyperthermia. Hypothermia, sorry, not hyper, hypothermia. David, your question of the day is, even if a diver suffers from decompression sickness in a remote location, you should never, ever, ever re uh, recompress the diver underwater. Now, I'd like to be clear on this one, by the way. Um, here's a, uh, here's a, a simple story. I was doing a dive in the river, and, uh, and the river was moving fairly quickly. Um, and I was doing a deco dive, which is a very big dive. I had multiple tanks, very safe, lots of weight, all the cool stuff, right? Extra tanks, deco blends, everything. Two computers. And I came up, was coming up along the wall, and I caught, I had 20 minutes of decompression required that I had to do. I had a 20-minute requ required safety stop. OK, if I came up to the surface without doing that, I would have got the beds. Um, I got to about the 20, uh, 28 foot, 25 foot mark. And I got into a uh, errant current that was all of a sudden along the wall and forced me up. Um, it, it, it flushed me to about the 17 foot mark. And along this wall, I was able to grab the wall at a slight indention with three of my fingers. I, there wasn't enough room for my fourth finger. OK. Um, and I held on for dear life for about four minutes before I finally lost my grip and it flushed me to the surface. I still had about 16, 17 minutes of decompression uh, left that was required. I backed away from the shore. I was on, I was uh, at the surface for about 10 seconds. I was showing no signs and symptoms of any decompression issues at all. I redescended and, and finished my decompression stop. Now, the difference between the question we just asked is, if a diver suffers from decompression sickness, if he's suffering from decompression sickness, uh, that means you notice there's there's a sign and symptom that says, oh, wait a minute, he's got DCS. He's got joint pains. He's aching, um, headaches, whatever it is. He's starting to become symptomatic. Uh, typically, DCS, just so you know, um, doesn't present for at least 15 to 17 minutes after surfacing is the most common time when DCS begins to present. So if somebody is starting to, suffering from DCS, we'll know it about 15 to 17 minutes after the dive because they're having pain, um, rashes, uh, disorientation, um, all, the, all the traditional signs and symptoms of DCS. That's when we, once we notice they're symptomatic, we don't take them underwater. And that's kind of the key to this. If you blow a safety stop, something happens, and you suddenly you're at 15 feet, you start your safety stop, you blow the surface, you can always redescend to 10 or 12 feet and you can finish your safety stop and 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 re and get that safety stop done. You recompress yourself. But remember, it, the, the, the idea of it is, is if you're symptomatic, no. If you're not symptomatic and you just blew it and it's been you've been on the surface for like five seconds or 10 seconds, go back down. You're good. Okay. The the better way to do that is not blow your safety stop. All right. I've got the que next question is for Michael. Michael, hypoxic hypoxia is the uh, by far the most common form of hypoxia. By the way, that sentence is really fun to say. Hypoxic hypoxia is another is the most conform, common form of hypoxia. The condition is when what? The partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood is too low. Exactly. That is exactly right. Good job. All right, Keelan, I got a question for you. When oxygen pressure in the body drops below partial pressure of 0.17, mild symptoms of hypoxia occur. Blackout and death may occur if the partial pressure of oxygen drops below. D, 0.1. Exactly right. Good job. All right. Finally, uh, David, I got one for you. A possible source of contaminated air in a scuba cylinder is? Uh, all the, all answers are correct. Absolutely. One of the things you'll find on site in third world countries is they'll use diesel compressors. And sometimes they'll take the exhaust and they'll have the intake too close together. Now, here's a pro tip for you. Um, breathing carbon monoxide uh, from a diesel motor um, is bad. Um, most boats are diesel bound. Now, breathing carbon dioxide from a diesel exhaust can reduce your body's uh, ability to uptake a process auction by three times to six times. Wow. That's pretty, by 30 to 60%. So as you get on the dive boat, the engine's usually in the back. The first thing you want to do is you get as far away from that engine as possible, get your gear set up and stay away from that engine. 
that exhaust because it will reduce your sac rate and your body's ability to process oxygen. So you'll go through more air during your dive. So as you go through the process, stay away from the diesel engine. Just a, just a good rule of thumb. So what we've been really tired of talking about, what the study, what we're learning is we're learning decompression theory. We're learning about how nitrogen works through the body, right? Now, decompression theory started uh, literally in the late 1800s. Um, shortly after we started understanding the idea that people got the bends from going too deep uh, as they were building the Brooklyn Bridge. Now, J.S. Haldane was the first person to really get into the idea of what decompression theory was. And he he was building on the work of uh, Paul Burt. And we talked about uh, uh, Paul Burt and, uh, and uh, uh, J. Lorraine Smith. And so he took their work and, and modified it. He was working for the British Admiralty and said, wait a minute, I got an idea. Here's what's going on. What it is is a two to one ratio. When night, when the gas we breathe gets to twice the amount of pressure of the surface, that's when problems happen. That's where nitrogen becomes too much. That's when everything happens, right? The bad stuff. We get the bends. We can get, you know, we can get to overexpansion injuries, all this fun stuff. Well, it, fast forward to about the fifth into the mid 50s, and, and we get uh, uh, Robert Workman, and he was a captain working for the Coast Guard, and also an MD at the time. And he said, wait a minute. Haldane, you're, you're close, but you missed something. And what he determined was that he says, we need to not look at the, the overall, we need to look at the parts of the gas within. And when we start looking at the parts of the gas within, we realize that it's the nitrogen that's the problem. And, and he came up with what's called Workman's Critical Difference. And Workman's Critical Difference basically said that when the partial pressure of nitrogen gets to twice that of the ambient pressure at the surface, that's when it becomes dangerous. Now, interestingly enough, Robert Workman was later proven wrong by uh, Albert uh, B uh, Buhlman, who was working um, out of Switzerland for Shell Oil, uh, dis uh, discussing and, and learning about how algorithms work. And we, and we still use to this day uh, J uh, Haldane, Haldanian math is what we call it um, within the Buhlman model. But for period of for purpose of argument, it really comes down to Robert Workman had a good idea that the partial pressure of nitrogen was just too much. And we, as we go through that process, uh, we understand that it's uh, that nitrogen in that system gets too much and we have to off gas it. And that's one of the reasons we use nitrox uh, because we're reducing that nitrogen. Um, and if we reduce that nitrogen, it has a harder time getting to a double partial pressure of the surface of that 158%. Makes sense. Now, overall, it's interesting to note um, that one of the ways that we eliminate that nitrogen in our system is the magic safety stop. And we've talked about this in, in, uh, uh, in class. Um, what we want to do is we talk about in the book that we're going to come up to 15 feet and we're going to stay there for three minutes. Now, I want to kind of co uh, not correct that, but give you a different thought process. Uh, as we start talking about this nitrogen going into our system, we start talking about what's called the M value. And the M value sounds really cool when you put it as M value. All it's really saying is it's the maximum amount of, of it's the maximum value or the maximum amount of nitrogen going to system. Think about uh, your, your tissue compartments like a balloon. There's a certain point where if you put one more puff of air into that balloon, it pops, right? The gas has to go somewhere. Same thing with your tissues. And while they don't pop, it just forces the bubbles to come out. That's the M value, the maximum point and a maximum amount of nitrogen that can go into a tissue. Now, the magic port thing to be aware of is this M value line that we look at. There's no hard set line that says, this is the point. Keelan, if you stay down <coughs> for 52 minutes and come to the surface from 40 feet, you're going to get the bends. There's no hard line. Michael, Keelan, David, all three of you off gas nitrogen and on gas nitrogen at different rates right this very minute. When you dive, it'll be at different rates. There's other factors involved in how you process this nitrogen. One of them being your hydration, how tired you are, your physical um, characteristics, how big you are, whether you're male or female, whether you ran the day before, whether you run on a regular basis, where you, whether you are a regular Dunkin' Donuts uh, and their, uh, their dozen donuts special. There's a lot of different factors that go into this, and there's no hard, fast line that says this is the actual line. But what we can say for sure is that if I do a shorter safety stop, I have less risk. 
if I do a sh or a longer safety stop, I have less risk. I apologize. I misspoke. If I do a longer safety stop or lesser safety stop, I have more risk. So what ends up happening is that there's that point as I'm coming up in the water column, the bubbles come out in the terms of bubble seeds, the, then the silent bubbles, and then they eventually become symptomatic bubbles where they start causing problems. And I notice that they're there. And that comes from faster ascents and less decompression. So what I want you guys to get from this chart is very simple. One, dive tables and safety stops are how divers manage the size of bubbles in their bloodstream. Two, safety stops assist in the reduction of the size of those bubbles. Three, there's no clear line between good and bad. And four, every diver is different in the way their body manages bubble size and reduction. Simple enough, do a safety stop. I know it's not required. It's just good practice. As you do go a through. safety stop from uh, 60 feet and you, less? Yes. Anytime you go past 20 feet for 20 minutes, you want to do a safety stop. Okay. Got okay. It. Thank you. Now, I'm going to give you guys a little bit different idea of a safety stop. Now, this is three different divers uh, and three different groups of divers. Diver one. Our diver group one, they did, uh, and all these um, all these divers did a 120-foot uh, dive for 20 minutes, okay, or 25 minutes. Diver group one came to the surface directly without doing a safety stop. They had almost 120,000 bubbles per cubic liter at the 15 to 16-minute mark. At the 30-minute mark, they were still at 60,000 bubbles per cubic liter. 45 minutes, the same at 60, uh, 60 minutes. They were about 30,000, uh, 30, and then they rose a little bit, and by the end of two hours, they were still at 19,000 bubbles per cubic liter. No safety stop. Dive group number two, they did a two-minute safety stop at 10 feet. Much different story. At the 15, 16-minute mark, they were at 19,000 bubbles per cubic liter, <laughs> decreasing consistently to the point at, at two hours, they were at about 8,000 bubbles per cubic liter. Here's the diver group I would like you guys to be in. They did a one-minute safety stop at 20 feet, 20 feet and a four-minute safety stop at 10 feet. When they came out of the water, they actually had a reduction down to about 7,000 8, to 8,000 bubbles per cubic liter at the 15-minute mark. And at 43 minutes, they had zero residual nitrogen. Is that fairly right, significant? Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's not, and we're not talking a huge amount of time. They did, instead of doing a two-minute safety stop, they did a five-minute safety stop. Huge reduction. So here's what I want you to take away from this. A safety stop reduces bubbles. A long safety stop reduces more bubbles than a short one. A dive, a five-minute uh, safety stop during repetitive dives increases your safety margin dramatically. Do a safety stop. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. What do you do during the safety stops? Um, I wonder if I should buy a dog, uh, or get a puppy. I, I think about if I left the stove on, um, uh, I think about it, uh, what I should get my wife for her birthday. Um, any number of things, usually I watch fish, uh, um, it, any number of things, but, um, safety stops and deco stops are the same thing. Uh, and if you're doing a deco, an hour long deco stop in the ocean, it's a long time to sit and watch the water go by. <laughs> It, so um, do you uh, program these, for example, those two safety stops uh, in, in your computer? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, the nice thing is, is with your dive computer, and we'll go through this in just a moment, but your dive computer will actually come up and tell you safety stop, and it'll have a, a countdown timer. Uh, both the computers you have, David, will do that. Uh, and oddly enough, As weird as this is, I just happen to have both of them on my desk here. I, I, I never have them. But as, as you look at it, it'll come up on your right-hand side over here, and it'll say, safety stop, and it'll give you a countdown timer. On your apex, it'll do the same thing. It'll give you a safety stop. Okay. So, put that back on. Perfect. So, almost fully charged. I'm going to put this back on the charger so I don't forget. I just, just barely put on the charger for this class. There we go. Uh, let's see. Yep. That was a 99. There we go. Good to go. So your computer will do that for you. It's kind of nice uh, to do that. So the big, big thing is here is do a safety stop. So as we kind of continue down this complicated values, 
the Navy uh, curated the first set of dive tables in the 50s. And what they did is they um, they came along and they said, we need to create a, a, a way to monitor and help our divers, because this is before computers, right, that we can determine how long they will be down um, and they could do something and do a task and come back up safely. So the intended use was for the Navy. Um, and what they, they came together, they, uh, they figured out a way that they can keep the divers safety. The intended use was, uh, was with that. Now, the challenge with it is, as we've kind of talked about, and I showed you guys in class, the limitation of the dive tables is they're based on a square profile. And what that means is at no point in any dive have I ever gone directly to 60 feet, stated exactly 60 feet for 50 minutes, and come back directly to the surface. So the nice thing with using a dive computer, one of the reasons I encourage getting your own dive computer, is it will take into account the times you are not at depth. And it'll give you credit for those, for the times that you're not completely get, uh, uh, against depth, uh, at the deepest depth. So it'll it, it'll more accurately monitor your your uh, nitrogen load. And that's what the, the dive computers did. The first dive computers came out in the 60s for the Navy to do exactly that. And they were top secret. After that, and, and towards the late 70s, um, the first recreational dive computers came out, and the first one being the Edge. Um, and uh, it was it had one goal in life, to measure the amount of nitrogen I will accumulate while during my dive. That's its intended use. Now, they have a few basic limitations um, of uh, on them as well. One of them is if you're diving at altitude, they won't monitor the nitrogen going into your system as you're going from a lower altitude to a higher altitude. Um, and they, the other limitation is they don't know you exactly. So again, like we talked about, Keelan, David, Michael, how you each absorb nitrogen is going to be different. This is not actually monitoring your bloodstream and your heart rate and anything else like that. It's based all on a basic algorithm that says, okay, this is the line where we think. Now, you may be closer to that line. You may be farther away from that line. It's hard to say, right? But its limitation is it doesn't know you as an individual because it has no way to do accurate measurement of your heart rate and your, your blood gas or anything like that. So um, that's the limit, biggest limitation. Some of the cool things, though, that as time goes by, we have definitely increased the quality of what we can do. For example, this is a Sunto uh, core, um, and it has the tank pressure on here. It has the no decompression time on here. Um, it has your total dive time, your depth, um, your temperature, as well as on the left-hand side, it's got this great ascent meter. And it's color-coded. It's pretty slick. It, actually, green, you're, you're ascending at a proper pace. Yellow, you're going too fast, dude. Slow down. And red, Stop, dude. You're going way too daggum fast. Um, they'll do other things as well. They'll also calculate some uh, some of your gas consumption. Um, it'll they do a lot of really neat, neat things. Um, and they'll give you be able to give this information to you later as well. You'll be able to download this information into your phone. Usually, most of them are set up with Bluetooth, and you're able to take a look at your dives and start building a basic idea of metrics across the board. You can say, okay, well, I went through this much gas because it'll tell you exactly, hey, wait a minute, I started at 1,810 PSI. I ended at 922 PSI. So it'll be very, very accurate when it comes to how it measures how much gas you use and you can do a lot more calculations. It'll show you your dive profile, your average depth, your your deepest depth, the temperature of your dive uh, throughout the dive because um, – there are uh, different depths at different temperatures. So the deeper you go, usually the cooler you get. So they do a lot of really, really, really cool things uh, for you to make your life substantially easier. Oh, we'll go back over to just me. There we go. All right. So overall, we just need to be aware that um, there are different types of profile, and different ki kinds of compression, uh, decompression ideas as we go through this process. Does it make sense, guys? Yes, thank you. Absolutely. So uh, what questions do you guys have at this point? Is the oxygen toxicity always the limiting factor? Or would you get in a situation where nitrogen is 
at your guys' right. level of diving, nitrogen will always be the, the limiting factor. For you guys to get deep enough and, and stay long enough um, to take a CNS hit um, is extremely unlikely. Gotcha. Now it's a great that's a great segue into what uh, where we're going to go. So one of the things that uh, we look at is our CNS clock as we start to look at this. Uh, and, and in your in my SI app, there is absolutely yeah. exposure. Okay. Oh yeah, I was just saying I'm I'm looking for it in the app. So we're looking for the CNS. Oh, yeah, here clock. it is. Yep, time exposure. So as we uh, look at this, we can start going to the idea that. Uh, if I'm doing a, uh, let me pick a good one here, a 57 foot dive on 36% nitrox, my partial pressure at 57 feet is going to be 0.98. So we'll just say one, we'll round up to one. So let's go over to our CNS clock and we can say, here's our 1.0 partial pressure. Now there's two numbers on this, this table to look at. The first one is the single dive limit. So at, at a partial pressure of 1.0, I can dive for 300 minutes in one dive without an issue. Now we generally want to try and keep to 80% or less of our, of our maximum number because this is the NOAA absolute limit. So if we're looking at this, we want to make sure we're, we're staying at a rate of 80% of that, which would be 20, 40, 60, that'd be 240. So we want to try and stay at 80% of this limit, but we can go up to 100% in one dive, but that's still a long dive. 240 minutes is a fairly long dive. Now, we also have a 24 hour limit and at 1.0, the 24 hour limit is the same. But how do we add up and say, okay, I'm gonna do a 60 minute dive or let's, let's say a, a 30 minute dive at 1.0. Well, we simply take 1.0 and we come over to the 30 minutes of actual bottom time and we realize that's 10% of my daily limit, because we can see the blue here, and 10% of my single dive limit. I'm sorry, the daily limit is the blue, and the 24-hour limit is, is, uh, is this. So overall, we can look at this, and we say that in 30 minutes, I'm, going, I'm using 20% or 10% of my total limit. And we can measure that out. We can say, what happens if we double that? Now we're at 20%. What happens if we're at um, 120 minutes? We're at 40%. So we can we can get an idea of what the the uh, total is. What happens if we go deeper? We get to a point of 1.4. So let's find a 1.4 here. Uh, here we go. If we did a 94 foot dive on 36% nitrox, we're diving at 1.39. So we'll say 1.4. That says we go over to our chart and we gives us a single dive limit of 150 minutes and a daily limit of 180 minutes. Make sense? So I, we, if we did a, uh, at that 1.4, we can do a 40 minute dive. So we just come over to 40 minutes at 1.4. That tells us that we just did 27% of our single dive limit in that 40 minutes and 22% of our daily limit. So that tells us we're going to have to do four dives for 40 minutes to that depth to get to our 24 hour limit. That's a lot of diving. Four so dives. We take Benjamin, when we take 80% of 150, does that change the 22% or the 27%? It would, absolutely, because you want to be less than that. So if my total limit is 150 in one dive, that means the longest dive I need to be doing is 120 minutes. But now here's here's our catch. Remember 1.4 on 36% nitrox, 1.4 was 40 minutes. So the maximum dive time we can do in one dive is 40 minutes. So you'll run into okay. nitrogen issues well before you'll run into on uh before you run into oxygen toxicity issues. Again, okay. so uh you would have to do if we look at that um at 1.4, we have 180 minutes, 180 times 0.8 is 144 minutes. So we'd have to spend 144 minutes at 1.4. So at 1.4, 144 minutes uh, divided by 40, 
that's that's literally four dives. So we're gonna have to do four dives to 94 feet in one 24 hour period. That's that's a lot of depth and a lot of time. You will run into the nitrogen nitrogen block well before you run into oxygen toxicity. But it's a good idea to keep keep up and keep an idea of what my CNS exposure is. What my and we call it a dose. Uh, what my CNS dose is because it's literally we're dosing ourselves with pure oxygen, right? <clears throat> but here we go back to our idea of the dive computer. The cool thing with the dive computer is it also will measure your CNS toxicity. <coughs> Makes sense. So it'll give you. An, an so is it showing that on here on this particular one? It's not showing it currently on this. It'll be a, on a different okay. screen, but right. it will absolutely give you your uh, keep track of your CNS for you. Nice. So to, to Michael's question, you'll absolutely run into a nitrogen block um, where you you've got too much nitrogen in your system well before you'll run into oxygen toxicity at your level. Where oxygen toxicity, we want to introduce it at this point because at this point in the game, uh, it's not a problem. But when you get to my point in the game, it absolutely is something that I watch very closely because I do those long dives. Um, and I'm doing uh, I'm on a lot higher percentage of oxygen uh, on a regular basis. So when you start getting to the more advanced dives, it absolutely becomes a problem. So be aware. It's not that big a deal, but it's definitely worth understanding. Make sense? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. The other chart we can look at as well, and I just I like to introduce this, but it, I don't want you guys to, to spin out too much on it, is the equivalent air depth in feet. So the nice thing with this is, is here's our traditional depth, 35 to 130 feet. If I'm diving 32% nitrox at 80 feet or at 98 feet, it's the same as diving air at 80 feet. Now, how can this be useful is a great question. Thank you for asking, Keelan. I, I read your mind on that. Um, so, for example, if I didn't have a dive table that had my exact number on it, for example, I'm diving... Oh, let's pick one. Uh, I'm diving 29% oxygen or 29% nitrox. And I want to be able to go to my dive table here and figure out, wait a minute, what am I, what's my nitrogen load on 29%? Well, good question. So if I'm doing 29% nitrox and I'm, I'm equal to 103 feet, I would use the dive table at 90 feet. So 29% down to whatever depth I'm diving, if I'm diving 92 feet, it's equal to 80 feet on air. So 20, I can go over to my dive table and I can say, okay, 80 feet, here's my, my dive times. I can dive deeper, yes, but I, as I go to figure out my, on my dive tables, I will use the equivalent air depth. And so the equivalent air depth in feet, if I'm diving 40% and I'm going to 76 feet, it's the same as diving a 50 foot dive. If, um, if I'm diving uh, 40% at 57 feet, which is your guys' limit pretty much, or we'll, we'll say 63 feet because we'll, well, I'll, I'll give you guys the three feet, right? If I'm diving 40% nitrox at 63 feet, I would do all my dive planning at 40 feet. So I'd come over to the dive table and I'd say, okay, 40 feet, 130 minutes, boom. So I can use this equivalent air table to figure out how to do my dive planning very simply. Make sense? And the good news is this table is in your book as well. So this, and what, what'll happen if you go to a, a, a place that does, uses non-standard nitrox, they, they don't have nitrox on a bank. Um, you'll typically see 32 or 36% on the boat when they just mix it up for you, uh, which is already on the table. But if you go somewhere standard and you, you measure your nitrox and they say, oh, wait a minute, You've got 33% uh, nitrox. That was what it measured out to. Okay, well, wait a minute. That's but that's more than 32 and less than 36. Perfect. I can just go to 33% and I can say, okay. Um, if I dive uh, 30 to 64 feet, I do all my dive planning for 50 feet based on air. And that tells me I've got a maximum dive time of 70 minutes. Make sense? And so we're using yes. the 50 foot in that example because that would be the nitrogen level at 50 feet on air. 
Correct. Okay. So that's how we do our dive planning. So we could on nitrox, we could do at 50 feet, uh, 40%, 76 feet would be to that. But if it was 33% at 50 feet, we could dive to 64 feet and we'd do our dive planning for 50 feet. We do it for shallower. And that's how right. we determine if we get a non-standard blend. Uh, if I gave you guys a blend of 25%, how would I do my dive planning? Um, I would go to 25% and I'd say, okay, today is going to be a 50 foot dive. So I'm going to do all my dive planning uh, or today I'm diving your 54 feet. I'm going to do all my dive planning at 50 feet. If I've got 26% and I'm doing a dive to 130 feet, I'll do all my dive planning for 120 feet. Got so it. it's a way to do, be able to do your dive planning to simplify things a little bit for you. Make sense? Yep. So uh, let me just make sure we read the chart correctly. Uh, Michael, on 1.2, what is my, uh, if I was down for 40 minutes on 1.2, what is my daily or my, not, my daily 24 hour limit for 40% at 1.2? My daily limit, 24 hour. Uh, 240 minutes at 1.2. So 17%. Okay. So I, my daily limit is 240 and my, uh, my 24 hour uh, time would be 17%. So you got it. I kind of asked the question a little goofy. So good job. Uh, Keelan, um, if I'm diving at one or 0.7, how much, what is my dose? What's my percentage dose at, at 0.7 for a 40 minute dive at 0.7? Seven percent. It is, and finally, and David, um, if I'm diving 1.0, 100 percent oxygen for 35 minutes, what is my daily and my 24 hour limit? 10 percent. Exactly. You guys got it. Good job. Um, let's go back over to my equivalent air table. Um, so, uh, Michael, if I'm diving 36 percent at 82 feet, how do I do my dive planning? What's my uh, air? 60 feet of air equivalent. Exactly. Keelan, if I'm diving uh, 29% at 83 feet, what's my equivalent air depth? Rounding up to 90? Wait, so, 30, sorry, you said 83 feet? Yeah. Oh, so 80 feet, sorry, rounding up. So if I, 30%, 83 feet, and I dive to 83 feet. Oh, I'm feet, sorry, I thought you said 29%. Okay, yeah, so 70 Feet. Sorry, I, I probably did. Okay. There yeah, go. I was looking at 29. No worries. Okay. All righty. David, if I dive 27%, I'm going to put my marker on there <laughs> since I, apparently I'm dyslexic today. Uh, if I'm diving 27% um, to 89 feet, what's my equivalent air depth? 80 feet. Exactly. That's how I do my dive planning. Again, this is my air dive planning. This is my actual. So if I dove had 31% and I dove to any one of these depths, this is what it would be equal to an air. And so you can see really quickly that it gets deeper. Now, just be aware, yellow means you're in the cautionary. You shouldn't be diving that. And red means you're absolutely where you shouldn't be. Fair enough? And that, that's determined by the percent of oxygen of 1.4, right? Correct. 1.4 and 1.6. Absolutely. So you guys shouldn't be going over 1.4 and you definitely shouldn't be croaching in on 1.6 at this point. Now, there absolutely is a point in the game of, of diving where you will absolutely go to 1.6. Um, and, and where you do that is called accelerated decompression. Um, when I do my deco stops and my hardcore decompression, because I've gone deep and stayed long, when I come up, I decompress at 1.6 because it, it accelerates the decompression and forces the nitrogen out of my system much more quickly and much more safely. So there is a time to do that, but you guys aren't anywhere close to that. So in case you're wondering why we have both, that would be why. Make sense? Yes. Thank Roger you. That. All right. Okay. Um, real quickly. I mean, this would be pretty much basic common sense, but diving after flying, Dan recommends that you don't die, you don't fly for 24 hours minimum after a dive. And I want to make sure you guys heard that minimum in there. Do you guys hear me say minimum? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Yes. I, I like to make sure. Now, here's a big thing. When we say minimum, 
Keila, what does that mean to you? That means don't cut it close. And honestly, if it was me, I probably would wait a full day. I would have a day between my last dive and my travel day. Absolutely. So your minimum is 24 hours. If you're on a dive trip that's, and you're doing three days for five straight days, take 36 hours. Do a day and a half. Right? Yes. With the type of diving Nikki and I do, um, it's pretty much required that we wait 36 hours after our last dive. Right? Because we're doing these big, big dives. Right? So just be aware. So, now, uh, go ahead. question, Benjamin. So, I was reviewing some material, and I and this may be old material, but I thought that the Dan's recommendation was if you're doing sixty feet or less, uh, no no de deco uh, dives, that it's twelve hours. If if you're doing a single deco dive, it's eighteen hours, and if you're doing multiple deco dives, it's twenty four hours. That's older information, absolutely. And uh, the, the recommendation is uh, from SSI and Dan is uh, for, especially for younger divers and newer divers is 24 hours. Okay. So make it just better off to stick with the longer. Uh, yeah, it so seems better to be conservative in that scenario. It absolutely is. Yeah. Why not be safer and, and uh, go through that process? So one of the magic questions, uh, Michael, thank you. I read your mind on how to, on this, by the way, that how do we know what's in our tank? We get this tank from the dive shop, and they say I was, actually, I was actually wondering that myself. I figured you were. I'm, you don't realize, but as a master mind. instructor, you 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 get a you get the magic hat that's psychic. So that's why I wear this because it's my psychic hat. Um, so one of the things you have to do is you have to analyze your tank. Now, there's a couple of pieces of this to be aware of. Um, I love my wife with all my heart and all my mind and all my strength, as well as I trust her with all my, that she gets everything if I die or become disabled. It's all hers, right? What's mine is hers and what's hers is hers. But will I allow her to analyze my tank? No. No. You should do it yourself. Why not? You're, you're like, primarily responsible for your own dive absolutely always analyze your own tank that's the number one rule it's your life on the line fun story for you uh nick and i had gone down to florida about a year ago and and there was a hurricane came through so we couldn't do all the dives we wanted to do in the ocean so we did a bunch of cave diving with tremendous amount of fun right uh hurricanes don't affect caves very much right it's, it's a cool thing but we found one dive on the, the last day of our vacation that we could dive that was going out. It was a 60 foot uh, reef, easy dive. And we got out there, we'd ordered nitrox up. They only had one, one flavor of nitrox, 36%. We were like, okay, cool, whatever, the 60 foot dives. Um, so uh, they started putting our tanks on the boat and the dive mat, I said to the dive master, I says, I, I need to analyze those tanks. And he looked at me and wrote like I was crazy. He says, but I analyzed them. I says, that's great, but I need to analyze them. And he says, I'm, I was, I'm a retired firefighter. Great. Thank you for your service. I need to analyze my tanks. Don't you trust me? Not for nothing, dude. I've met you about a, 60 seconds ago, so you could be Jeffrey Dahmer for all I really know. Yes, I need to analyze my tanks. He says, but I'm a retired firefighter. I says, again, thank you um, for being a firefighter, but I was a Marine, so it, it's not really germane to this conversation. I need to analyze my damn tanks. And he's like, oh, okay. He was very confused. All right, recreational boat. <clears throat> Don't be on that boat. And I made him get the analyzer. And I, we analyzed our tanks, right? And so we went through the process. Now, analyzing the tanks is a really simple process. Simple enough. You're going to take your tank and you're going to look at it. You're going to take your analyzer and you're start with your analyzer. First, getting your analyzer, you're going to want to calibrate it. And there's a couple ways to calibrate this. Simple enough. You can wave it around in where you're at um, and you can analyze it to 21% or 20.9% if you want to be super accurate. Um, and usually it's on a dial and you're going to uh, turn that dial till it gets to that point. Now, here's your challenge. If you're on a boat, will that be accurate? Not if you're over. Yeah, not if you're on seawater. No, seawater is heavier. It's going to read off. So the best thing you could possibly do is take it to a known tank that you know what's in the tank right to calibrate so you want to start with calibrating your your auction sensor and analyzer by taking it to a standard air tank and, and what you do is you're going to want uh, turn your analyzer on 
you're going to put it over the nozzle of the actual tank and turn that tank on slightly, very gently, because you don't want to blow that analyzer out. You just want to get it to the point where it goes, tss. I don't know if you can hear that. Tss. That's. But if you hear, Shh, that's too much, tss, is all you want, just a light turn on. Once it turns it on you and it starts, give it uh, five to 10 seconds and, or to the point where the numbers stop moving. Once those numbers stop moving, you'll be able to calibrate it to 21% or 20.9%, however accurate you want to be. Once it's analyzed to that and it's calibrated, you will then take it to your tank. You'll put the tip of the analyzer um, over the end of the tank. You'll turn your tank on again very gently and you'll wait till the numbers stop moving. Usually it's about five to 10 seconds. Once it stops moving, it'll give you a percentage. That's all there is to it. Now, now there's a lot of different analyzers out there. Um, I, I particularly use, I like the, the Nuvo Air. It's my personal favorite. I have one, the Nuvo Air Stick. Um, I don't have it in my office currently. I usually do. Um, I don't know where it, I've set it somewhere. Uh, my wife knows where it's at, I'm sure. But it's a stick. It's a Nuvo Air Stick. Um, very simple. Stick it over the end. Another type they have is actually has a yoke or a DIN adapter. You plug it in um, and it literally goes into the analyzer and you turn the tank on all the way and you wait till the numbers change. You'll want to ask wherever you're at um, to show have them show you how to calibrate their analyzer to make sure you get it. They're all pretty basic and pretty simple to do. Other ways you can do it. Um, they do have, yes, sir. Uh, I think the Apex that uh, computer I have came with the analyzer. It did. And it looks like it screws on to the tank. It does. It doesn't screw okay. on the tank. It does not. It, it goes over the end of the tank. Just okay. by chance. Just hold it in front of it then. Hold it in front. I okay. just by chance happen to have one. And so... Um, I don't use the uh, the one from Apex very often, but it, you have to have the auction sensor. I haven't taken it out of this little thing. You put it in to the point, and then you put the cap over top. Now, this cap, you'll notice, has a little hole in the end of it. That's what right. actually goes over the end of the tank, the, the actual valve of the tank. Okay. That's your little reader. Um, I, I, I don't use this one. I've, I've got it. If I need it, I have a separate auction analyzer, um, that I prefer. Uh, I have a new bar stick, um, but there's other types as well. There's Palm air. Um, Palm air makes a really slick one that, uh, it has a little, uh, hose. You put it on the inflator after you put the tank on, on your, uh, actual tank and it goes in the inflator like that. Um, I, it's pretty slick. I prefer the hand analyzers though. I, I they're much more accurate. Now the next key point about this is, is we need to mark the tank. Now, the first thing I hate about this slide is don't put a tag on it. Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Once you know what it is, you're going to mark it with the percentage of gas, what its maximum operating depth is, as well as what partial pressure you're using. And make sure when you put um, the maximum operating depth on it, you put it in either feet or you, like, for example, 109 FT or 33.9 M. Make sure to put what the unit of measurement is. That's extremely important. And there were some deaths over uh, last summer in Europe because uh, they were mislabeled. The Europeans thought it was metric. The Americans uh, had put it in, in uh, imperial and it caused a pretty serious issue. So make sure you put all this and who did it initial it and sign it and put it. I put it in duct tape along the top at the bottom in the front on the, uh, on the bottom, on the side, on, on, on the butt of the tank. So I put it in four separate places, neck, front, back, and bottom. When I, when I mark my tank, that way it's extremely clear. And the reason I do that is that way, if I put it on the back in nice big letters that the maximum operating depth of this tank is 100 feet and I'm diving along and my buddy's right behind me and I'm at 110 feet, he can look at the back of my tank and say, wait, oh, hey, dude, what the heck? You need to get the heck up. You need, you're too deep. You haven't been paying attention like you should have been. So mark it. And, and when you mark it on the bottom side of the tank, 
I use the entire piece of duct tape. I make a nice big piece and I put in very clear letters, 100 feet, 100 FT, M-O-D, big letters, front, back, bottom. That way it's clear that uh, my buddy as a team member can see that very clearly. I also put it at the neck and I sign the neck as well. That is my tank. There are many like it, but this one is mine. My tank is my life. <laughs> I must master this. I must master my life. I'm just, sorry, the Marine Corps is coming out um, <laughs> as well. So be aware, they have to be marked very clearly. Other things to be aware of, your tank, if you're running nitrox, will need to have a yellow and green sticker on it that in, in moder- uh, notates it that it is a nitrox tank. It will also have a service tag on it notating that it's been O2 clean. Now, this is pretty important. One of the things that you do not want to do is you do not want to take an air tank and just suddenly slap nitrox in it. What happens is, is air has fluorocarbons in it. And the problem is, is when fluorocarbons come in contact with pure oxygen under pressure, the the pressure creates heat and it can cause an explosion. Uh, I'm a general fan that explosions are probably bad especially when it comes to my scuba tank. So one of the things we do with a scuba tank is we start by cleaning it. We O2 clean it. The first thing we do is we put it on a roller. We literally run rocks in it to clean all the, the burrs, abrasions, crap, yuck out of it and clean the fluorocarbons out as well. We then we then took a cleaner and we uh, put that cleaner in inside of it and we roll it with the cleaner in it to clean the rest of the fluorocarbons out. Once that's all cleaned out and, and ready to go, we change out the rings, the the actual rubber seals on it from normal air rubber seals to Viaton rubber seals. Um, and it's pretty important to do that um, because oxygen has a um, corrosive effect to it as well. It'll oxidize things and cause them to rot faster, right? So we change out those rings to make sure that they're Viaton so that they're prepared and ready for oxygen. Now, the good news is, is most regulators already have what we call rule of 40. Now there's a um, there's a point after 40%, oxygen becomes even more, um, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the word, um, co- or not caustic, but corrosive. It, um, it oxidizes more after 40%. 40% is kind of the, the limit portion and, and most gear is set to that 40% part. It's one of the you know, reasons that Nitrox 2, that what we're certifying you guys in today has a limit of 40%, okay, because of rule of 40. So most most regulators um, that you'll buy out of the box will be rule of 40 or 40% uh, ready, right? They can't go above that, but they can go up to 40% um, on that. So they've got the right seals and everything else so they won't oxidize and cause problems. Um, and if they oxidize and cause problems, that eats that ring, it, you'll, you can have a burst disc, you can have uh, a lot of different issues. So they're prepared for it. So we want to make sure that whatever we're diving is ready for nitrox. Um, if we're diving a cylinder, it has been prepared and ready to to dive nitrox as well. It'll be well well marked with a nice big nitrox sticker on it. And it'll also ha- um, have a service tag on it as well. And then we, before we dive it, we need to make sure we analyze it as well as uh, mark it to let ourselves remember what is in that tank. Easy enough? And that yeah, service there... tag is good for 12 months? Yeah, the, the visual inspection. Um, so tanks have to be visually inspected once every 12 months, and they have to be hydrostatically tested every five years. So uh, for your oxygen clean is good as long as it's only had nitrox in it. If, it. if you use a tank anytime that 12 months and you just put air in it, you have to re-clean that tank to get the fluorocarbons out. And, and we would actually never know that if it's a rental somewhere. Yeah. Exactly. That, that's where it gets a little scary. Hopefully they've always just used nitrox. Most reputable shops, it's not too much of a worry on that as well. So just be are aware. There, of, go ahead. Any other, yeah, I was just curious, are there any other parts of the air delivery system that would need to be swapped out or is it just the actual rings in the tank itself? Um, in the air delivery system, that'd be like your regulator. Um, yeah your hoses, any of that, exactly. Um, they can run air and nitrox because it's not air under pressure. They're not dealing with, they're not dealing right. with the same dynamic with when it comes to the fluorocarbons, right? Okay. Yeah, that uh, makes sense. Just making it. What about so, stage one? 
<laughs> so yeah, so your regular, your, so your regulator, your um, your regular hose, any of those pieces, they'll they'll already be have all the seals and pieces in there, so that are already set up for up to forty percent in them. But because they don't have, uh, they're not remaining under pressure. We don't have the fluorocarbon issue. Where the issue becomes is in the tank. Um, if the tank has the fluorocarbons in it, it's, it goes under pressure. It could cause it could cause some bigger problems, right? So we want to make sure that that's always um, only used for nitrox at that point. But overall, the seals are the bigger piece because the, um, like I said, the the higher concentrated oxygen will cause oxidization. And because of that oxidization, it'll eat through the, the rings and seals on your regulator much more quickly. And that definitely is a problem. So we want to make sure we're very careful with that. And that uh, we're, we've got, if we're diving nitrox, our gear is rated for the nitrox. Now, one of the things, some of my regulators are rated up to 100%. And the way to get them there is we had to take them apart and replace all the seals and all the rubber inside them with um, uh, rubber and seals that were rated for up to 100%. Now, on a kind of a side note, one of the things you'll find is when you dry suit dive, you do not use nitrox as the inflation gas. You can dive mm -hmm. nitrox with a dry suit as long as your inflation gas is not nitrox. So the way you do that is you have to set up and have a separate cylinder just for inflation. And uh, typically a dry suit diving, if you're using, if you're going that far, that separate cylinder is usually argon. And argon is not breathable, but it's four times denser than air and it has a better insulation factor. But you don't want to use nitrox as your inflating factor in a dry suit because it'll literally rot your dry suit, oxidize it from the inside out. And that, that's bad. And as David might uh, might be well aware at this point, a dry suit ain't cheap. <laughs> but it's okay to use it as an inflation gas in a standard BC. In a standard BC, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. It's not um, your BC is absolutely rated for it and built for it. So you're not okay. a big deal. Absolutely. So just be aware um, as you guys are working with this, um, oxidation wear um, definitely causes risks for explosions. So working with higher percentage of oxygen is definitely um, to your uh, to your advantage to understand that you're working with something that can cause an explosion and, and can create uh, bigger issues as you go along. So it's one of the reasons that we stick with this rule of 40. You guys are safe at, at 40% and less. Um, it's not as big a problem, but it can be absolutely a problem to be aware of. Um, overall, that's the keys to it. Um, so, uh, Michael, what's what's one big key thing that um, you didn't know before that, uh, that you just gained out of this class? Uh, I didn't know that oxygen was toxic at high levels. Um, I didn't know about Henry's law. Um, basically, all of it is was new. I was familiar Good. with partial pressures from high school and college chemistry, but um, it's definitely interesting, isn't it? Yeah, now, if, yeah, fascinating. If you guys like this type of material and like the this kind of the science behind this kind of stuff, we have a fantastic class. I'm actually putting one together now called Science of Diving. I've got uh, some people that are have, were interested in taking that course. Now, Science of Diving goes through all the facts and figures and all the detailed portions behind all the science. And go, we go a lot more into the math. We go a lot more into the science. We've got more in, into the uh, science between de of decompression theory as well. And it's extremely interesting. It's a four-night class. Um, and honestly, I have a hard time teaching it in only four nights um, because it's so much fun. It's so interesting. So if you're interested in that, Science of Diving is definitely an amazing class. It's it's one of my favorite classes to teach because it is so techy and so it's extremely nerdy. But it really helps understand what's going on behind what we're talking about. Um, Keelan, what are what's something you learned tonight that you didn't know before? It was really interesting to study the additional dive tables um, beyond what we learned about in class and then apply them to those dive tables learned in class. Awesome. And David, what did you learn today? Yeah, so I was surprised that 62 feet on nitrox is equivalent to 50 feet, which does mean you can go deeper with nitrox. To a certain degree, absolutely. You, you, you can go deeper. Um, and have it equivalent out, but there is a, absolutely a limiting factor to that as well. So it's a yes and no. Yes, you can yeah. go deeper to a certain point, but 
as you start getting too deep, it becomes a, a bigger issue, right? Right. And we're all still approved to dive to 60 feet as Correct. level Correct. one divers. And if you're interested in moving past that, we do have a deep dive class. Um, it's a little tough to teach right now because the lake is frozen. So <laughs> um, I absolutely love going under, under the ice, but you guys aren't ready for that, to be very frank with you. I don't oh. know if I'll ever which, be which ready for it. In in I'm sorry, say again, Michael? Sorry, Dylan. I was saying, which lake do you dive in that's more than uh, 60 feet? Uh, Ryrie, the Ryrie Reservoir, right out the uh, 20 minutes from our house. Um, mm -hmm. I've gone out and done three-hour dives out there with an hour of it being at 130 feet. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, the deepest the deepest I've ever seen that lake, I, I found, I got out there one time at a high level, and the lake was 150 feet. So I, I've got a 151-foot dive at Ryrie Lake. Um when the water level was, when the lake was full, it's harder to do when the lake's down. If the lake is at uh, 55%, it's um, about the deepest you'll get is 130. Um, and you got to work to get there. There's a smaller area. It's about the size of a half a football field that you can get into about 130 feet. But when the lake's full, that uh, hundred, that same spot is 151 feet, 152 in that area. Cool. And you've been 100, 100 feet exactly. in the Snake River? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was surprised to hear that. More yeah. surprised than the reservoir. Where in the Snake River can you dive that deep? Nearby? Um, Idaho Falls. Um, John's Hole oh. Bridge um, to the, uh, oh, which is the bridge that goes over 20. Um, okay. And then uh, just up or just downstream from downtown, um, just across from the art museum. If you go in there um, on the opposite side from the art museum, that's where you get in. Um, it's pretty cool there. You can get down to about 105, 110 feet there. Um, and there's, I haven't so found well. it yet, but I've, I've wanted to, there's a, a railroad car down there. And there's also a, uh, um, a 20 to 30 foot propeller from one, from the dam that they dropped down there and they couldn't recover. Oh, wow. Uh, so it's down there as well. And then, it, um, on the, on the upper side, up the falls, uh, at John's hole, that's where all the sturgeons are. Um, and oh, so cool. there's a That's ton awesome. of, I mean, four to eight foot sturgeon and the sturgeon are very, they're, they're very docile and they're very, they're, I, I wouldn't say friendly, but, uh, they just don't really care about you that much. <laughs> uh, so it, it makes for a really interesting dive and that's about a hundred feet in the river. But, uh, if you're doing that dive, it's I, I hate, the best way I can say is it's, it's just, a, it's a really big kid dive. It's not oh, one sure. that you guys would be ready for in, in a, uh, for a while. Um, it's absolutely a dry suit dive. It's absolutely a dark dive and night and limited visibility dive. It's absolutely a river current dive. Um, so there's definitely some factors in there that are concerning. And then it's a deep dive as well as um, by the time you get down where you want to see something, um, if you're not a, a, a technical diver um, and prepared for that, for DECO, um, you'll absolutely um, you have to just turn around and come back because you won't be able to stay long enough. So it's, right. it's, it's one of those ones. I like doing it. Um, I'm a typical, I'll get down to hundred feet and I'll stay an hour is about right for me about an hour, hour and 10 minutes, um, in that area. Um, which gives me about, uh, 40 minutes of actual bottom time, um, at that depth. But I mean, that's multiple tanks and, and a lot of lead. <laughs> yeah. So absolutely. I was just messing around in the SSI app and I clicked on locations and it shows those dive sp spots in Idaho Falls. Absolutely. Oh, interesting. Okay, cool. Absolutely. I'm doing both. They're awesome. Um, but like I said, they're, they're definitely big kid dives. Um, it's ones that you want to be, you need to have your, your, your big kid pants on for those. <laughs> So. Benjamin, in what, what situations would you use other blends of gases such as helium? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, if you're getting into helium, that's called trimix. Um, and what ends up happening is you, as you noticed, the partial pressure of oxygen gets to be too much, right? As you start getting to, you know, uh, 130 feet, um, you're, you're really uh, ramping up on that partial pressure where it's, it gets dangerous, right? Um, so what you can do is you can reduce the part, the amount of oxygen. So for example, a, a common nitrox blend might be 18 percent, um, 18 percent oxygen and 20 percent helium. So it reduces the amount of nitrogen. And it also reduces the partial pressure of oxygen as well. So that's a pretty common uh, light blend, uh, but it gets they get more and more. So what you do is you replace the the oxygen and the nitrogen with helium. So that you use you start the surface at uh, with a lower percentage of oxygen, and so 
At certain depths, you can dive that to it. And then that's if you're going to really deep um, and you're starting to get to, for example, if, if you're doing a 175 or 200 foot dive, oxygen is absolutely going to be toxic uh, at that point, right? You're going to get into some big issues at, at that depth. Um, and uh, nitrogen is going to be highly narcotic. So you want to, you'll replace most of that with uh, uh, helium and uh, you'll dive a very, like you'll do a, a, a 1040, for example, is a, is a Trimix blend that you'll use. You'll start the service with a 10% oxygen blend and 40% um, helium yeah. and 50% nitr uh, nitrogen, right? So you can get down to that depth and uh, you'll be able to breathe it. But the problem is you won't be able to breathe that gas on the way down. You have to have what's called a travel mm -hmm. gas. So you have a travel gas to get you there, and then you'll switch to the deeper gas um, as well. And so once you get to that deeper gas, um, then you can use that down there and you'll be just fine. So common blends are like uh, for nitrox or for uh, trimix or are, let's see, like 2135 is a pretty common one. That's for just if I want to spend a long time at 130 feet, I might, I might use a 2135. If I'm getting deeper than that and I'm starting to get in that 160 foot to 200 range, I might do an 1845 possibly a 1555 uh, those 15. are only two numbers those aren't three numbers oh well, you you just um figure that the last percentage is the amount of nitrix nitrox or, or nitrogen left nitrogen. so you, you you only talk about the percentage of oxygen or the percentage of oxygen in, in helium everything okay. else is whatever's left over is nitrogen so okay. uh another common blend where you start getting really deep pat, uh, into the 200 foot range is a, a 1070 where you're literally starting with 10% oxygen at the surface and 70% um, helium, um, which leaves you 20% nitrogen. So um, that's, it's for, when you start getting in deep diving, where it really gets interesting is um, it, we start looking at the gas densities, right? And you start talking about gas density. Um, there's a point at about a hundred and, uh, I'm sorry, I take it back, about 270 meters um, of depth we start to get into the 800 to 900 foot range of depth um, where helium even becomes too heavy to breathe. Um, so um, they're the experiments that are going on right now, really getting interesting where they're doing uh, they're starting to move to hydrogen and experiment with hydrogen. So it's really interesting because hydrogen is literally, um, Oh gosh. Uh, what is it? Uh, half less. It's about half the weight of helium. So helium weighs 0 0.179 uh, grams per liter. Um, hydrogen weighs 0 0.09 grams per liter. So it's it's literally half the weight of helium. So as you get those deep to partial pressures, you can use height. They're starting to use hydrogen, which is a lot lighter gas, and it's not as heavy, and it doesn't cause as many problems. So do you, that's, that's do, you come, do you come out of the water sounding like Mickey and Minnie Mouse? Now that's a great question. Um, so saturation diving is, um, and that deep diving is when when you're breathing helium. So saturation sat divers, where they're doing those deep, um, deep, deep dives in a bell, and and they're going down and doing working on oil fields at 900 feet. Um, they're breathing helium the whole time. If you ever get a chance to listen to a sat diver when they get back in the bell that's breathing that helium, that's they sound exactly like that as they're talking. In fact, a really great movie. If you want a great movie about saturation diving, it's the best. Um, BBC, um, uh, 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 what do you call it when it's a real movie? Um, uh, documentary. documentary. Yeah, the best documentary from BBC I've ever seen in my life, and it's free on Netflix. is called Last Breath. It is. It was the most suspenseful, best um, documentary I think I've ever seen. And it, when you hear the the saturation of divers go into saturation and, and a pressure, they're absolutely. Me, 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 me. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so does helium perfuse into your tissue but it's so small that it off gases like immediately exactly and oddly enough it actually increases the amount of time for decompression because it goes into your tissue so quickly and it um it's harder it takes longer for the nitrogen to come out because of the helium the helium actually blocks it so oh, there's some other interesting things about um utilizing helium as part of it um there's also something called um, isometric counter diffusion. And what ends up happening is if, if you don't, um, come out of helium in a slow way, if you, if you, for example, were diving, um, 10, 70, um, 70% helium, right. And you went straight to, um, a 
an air blend or a decompression blend, you can get uh, isobaric counter diffusion. What happens is the nitrogen actually gets caught in the air spaces in your ears and causes you to become extremely confused and, and disoriented. So as you off gas from helium, you have to do it very specifically as well because you start getting where we have the bends. Now you all of a sudden, now you get a whole new type of bends called isobaric dis counter diffusion. So it gets really interesting. The physics behind it is amazing. <laughs> I love it. Is your, is your science of diving course listed on the website or how, how do we learn more about that? Um, we, you talk, you just tell me that you're interested and we set up a class. I'm, I'm right now putting together a class on it as we speak. Um, and it'll probably be uh, later this month is, is my goal. Uh, I was looking at like the uh, the 19th and 26th um, as two of the dates. So if you guys were, are interested in science and diving, I, I'm happy to take your information and, and make sure that, to let you know when, the, when that course is. Do you it's need to have a lot of dives under your belt? Because I'm, I'm a total beginner, but I like science and nerd out on numbers. Oh, you and me both. Um, absolutely. It, you, it's it's a great course for a beginner. I teach the course to the level of my students. Um, okay. I've taught I've absolutely taught it to the to the lower level of science of diving. And I've absolutely the last one I taught, I had four students in the class that were all uh, moving towards tech and they were uh, pretty damn close to being instructors. And so I, I taught it at a very high level. And so we really got it. We got into the weeds pretty deeply. It was awesome. So I, I will teach it to the level that you guys are. And uh, so if you guys are uh, needing a little bit better explanation, we'll take longer and I'll teach, teach to that level, but we'll get you there. Absolutely. Is that in person or zoom? It'd be a zoom. Okay. Cool. Yep. I, I, I do 90% of my classes uh, via zoom. It just makes it easy for, for everybody. Usually uh, my zoom classes, I wear a polo and, and jammy pants. I am wearing my house slippers today. <laughs> So there you go. Any more questions? David, let's jump into you. What did you learn today that was interesting that you didn't know before? Yeah, again, I thought it was interesting that we could go to a degree uh, deeper, uh, which, you know, I'm really just kind of focused on 60 feet for the next several months, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, having gone through the, the, the book, watching the previous Nitrox class and this one, uh, I'm pretty familiar with the material at this point. Good, 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 good. And that's a good thing. I just want to reiterate to you guys. If you go to my Teach Me to Dive site uh, on YouTube, I've got um, this class and I'll have other classes as well that you guys can preview and go through. I, um, I put these classes out there for you guys to learn. It doesn't replace certification by any stretch of the imagination, but um, it definitely gets you ahead of the, ahead of the curve. It was really helpful because... Uh, coming in to the this class tonight when you were saying things it made more sense tonight than in the previous class and the homework good yeah don't be afraid to to watch these classes again or watch other ones i've i, I want to say i've got three or four nitrox classes up um so you're welcome to watch any of them they're they're on my channel and that's what that's what i put them there for is uh for for you guys to be able to watch so and this class, you know, I noticed that each class is really personalized to uh, what questions people have. Absolutely. That's that's kind of the benefit. I, I looked up on my my thing. I've got uh, five nitrox classes up. So there's five different nitrox classes and and you'll find a little bit different. Uh, for example, the last class, we didn't get into the uh, the equivalent air depths um, at all. The class wasn't ready for it. Mm, so, yeah, that was new material tonight. So I want to make sure that you guys get um, a class that you're ready for. And, and I, I try and teach to what you need to know and when you need to know it. You guys needed to know it and you're ready and you need uh, you're ready for it. So there you go. Awesome. Thanks. Perfect. Any more questions? I'm set. Looking forward to this weekend. 